Welcome to another RDWorks Learning Lab. As you can see, we're not in the workshop at the moment. I seem to remember many sessions ago when I very first, excuse the pun, focused on lenses. I said, I think I might be opening Pandora's box here. Well, yeah, Pandora's box seems to be absolutely bottomless because although we've made some interesting discoveries in the past few sessions, about the unique two-part nature of a lens. It has a, an engraving characteristic, short focus, and a cutting characteristic, which nobody talks about, long focus. And we've been able to separate those two things out by being rather destructive with lenses. Drilling a hole through the middle of the lens removes its cutting ability and then grinding away the outer reaches of the lens, leaving just a central island, removes the ability of the lens to focus. So I think we've proved fairly conclusively that a lens has got two distinct characteristics which you can separate out. Now, today's session is a deeper investigation into the thing that I've always questioned, which is focus. Now we are going to do some more destructive work with lenses later on, but I just want to discuss initially what the word focus actually means, because we're going to have to start off our tests by analysing what we consider to be the correct focus of a lens before we start destroying the lens and changing its characteristic. So come on in and I'll show you what I mean. Now here we've got a very simple plano convex lens with parallel rays of light uh, and of course these are laser beams of light where we've got a much higher intensity of light at the centre than we have at the outside and here we've got the parallel rays of light hitting the lens and it really depends on how you orientate the lens as to what happens to that light as it passes through the lens. Now obviously you can see at a glance if we use the lens this way round, we get a much better, still not good, although this picture is very exaggerated, it is not a perfect focal point. We get some aberration still, where the rays from the outside cross over before the rays from the centre. So we get this spread of focal points. So question is, where is the correct focal point that the manufacturer quotes. In general, I think it's somewhere around about here. If I was to draw like a silhouette following these beams, it would produce a sort of a, a waste effect in here. And the smallest part of that waste is what they would tend to call the spot size or the focal point of the lens. So that focal point or spot size just here is really the point through which all the rays pass. Now that's not the same as this theoretical spot size that everybody talks about for lenses, because this spot size is actually probably, from all experiments that I've done, anything from four, six times bigger than the theoretical spot size for the lens. When we put a lens this way, we get a parallel beam which hits this surface here and refracts through the material. It then comes out of the material and refracts again. So there's a double refraction occurring when you use a lens this way round. And it is this double refraction effect which tends to give us a better quality focal point. But although this picture is exaggerated, you can see that it's not a particularly good quality focal point. Now, when I turn the lens over, we have a completely different situation. First of all, these parallel rays hit the first surface of the lens, and because they're hitting the lens at a normal, i.e. 90 degrees to the surface, there is zero refraction. And so consequently, they just pass right through the lens until they hit the second surface and pop back into the air. And when they pop back into the air, they get refracted. But the refraction 
then occurs in a completely different way as you can see. Now although these two pictures are exaggerated I think you can clearly see that the nominal focal point for this one is probably somewhere about here whereas the nominal focal point for this one is somewhat shorter. It comes back to this question what is the focal point because when we try and find the focal point by drawing the thinnest line we're not really finding the focal point. We've got rays that are coming in from here which are very very low power and will have no effect on cutting unless we're moving very very slowly in which case the power will have a chance to do some burning. We've got these rays that are coming down the center which have got high power and they're also being focused. So the chances are that the maximum power to burn will be maybe here, below the focal point. The question is, we think that that is the focal point because that's where we can get our thinnest line. But having said that, we can probably get an even thinner line if we run a bit faster, then we shall filter out this power and we'll be just left with this power. So that means the focal point will be even further forward than the nominal focal point. When you've got variable power, you've got all these potential variable focal points. This one is not going to have any effect. This one, because it's only moderate power, will have some burning effect. But it's these central ones where the maximum intensity exists that's going to have the maximum burning effect if we run at a high-ish speed. If we run at low speed, then not only will we get this burning effect, but will we start bringing in more and more of these. Because the slower we run, the more the exposure time, and the more of this will actually include in the burn of our line. So that clearly explains why we get what appears to be a variable focus depending upon speed. And this is what I want to look at today in great detail. We'll probably find that we get a wider range of focal distance as we change speed than what happens with this one when we change the speed. We'll probably find that we get a narrower focal range. Now, when I say narrower focal range, what I mean is net burning range. You know, the power of the beam is probably between here and here as we change speed. Whereas here, it's gonna change from here to here. It's gonna be a much wider range of focus, as we call it focus, but it, as you can see, there is no such thing as a focus. It really depends on the speed. That's why we get this thing that I call dynamic focus. So there's a lot more to lenses than people lead you to believe. Now I'm particularly interested in gallium arsenide lenses from the work that I've done so far because what I can see so far is that if we take a four inch zinc selenide lens we get a, a kerf which is as you can see could be quite wide whereas when I put a two and a half inch lens instead of this it performs the same function as a four inch lens in terms of cutting ability but it does it at a much narrower kerf width. This is something I've not really understood, but I've always believed that my two and two and a half inch gallium arsenide lenses are the most amazing lenses in my huge range of lenses. And they're the ones that I keep coming back to for cutting. So I'm gonna have a look through to see if I can find a spare two and a half inch and a spare two inch gallium arsenide lens and see if we can modify it I'm not going to be drilling a hole through the lens. What I'm going to be doing is grinding a parallel face across the front here and just leaving a small portion of the lens to do the work. And I want to see what happens to the focal distance, the cutting ability of the lens. I picked up this two and a half inch gallium arsenide lens and I fitted it in here and it's probably a little bit out of focus. Well, it's a long way out of focus at the moment. In fact, I can make sure it's out of focus by lifting it up and then we'll just do a pulse and there we go so we've got a little mark on there so here's our dot and this has been made on a piece of 
something like cartridge paper that's about 0.3 millimeters thick. It's actually used for watercolor um, work. That's what it's designed for. So it's not, it's fairly absorbent, which means it hasn't got much binder in it. Certainly not much kaolin. You've heard me mention this term before, damage threshold. Well, this paper has a damage threshold. That's approximately what that dot looks like when we magnify it under the microscope. We've got a hole in the middle where obviously the damage threshold of this material has been exceeded and we've knocked away all the material itself. So here we've not exceeded the damage threshold. What we've done, we've got various degrees of damage that we're performing on this material. Now this is where focus becomes uh, about as clear as my coffee. The dictionary definition of focus is very simple. Parallel rays hitting a refracting surface or a reflecting surface can be focused down to a single point. Now that's very clear, but in the world of physics, that dictionary definition isn't quite true. We cannot ever focus light down to a point. The limiting factor is the wavelength of the light. We've got 10 micron wavelength light here, which means the smallest possible hole we could ever get through there would be 10 microns, 0.01. And 0.01, now you can't see that. You can read the dimension on there, 0.03, but that is just one of my gray hairs. That's what 30 microns looks like. You can't even see the gap between the jaws of the caliper there. Now there's also something else called a theoretical spot size. And the theoretical spot size changes for the focal length of the lens. If the focal length changes and physics doesn't change, if we can work with 10 microns as our smallest hole, why can we not get 10 micron smallest spot size for every lens type? It's just because in the practical world they've found that it isn't possible. So there is a theoretical lens formula which puts in some sort of fiddle factor which gets us from 10 microns up to some other dimension which is theoretically achievable by calculation. For an inch and a half lens this theoretical spot size is 0.07, 70 microns, not 10 microns. And then as we start going up in focal length, that changes from 70 to 100 to about 120. Something about reality is getting in the way that prevents us achieving a 10 micron hole for every single lens. We know why a picture like this comes about for us with our laser machines, it's because we've got something called a Gaussian distribution in our beam diameter. Basically what that means is we've got more intensity at the centre of the beam than we have at the outside edge of the beam. And hey, intensity equals damage if you remember. So here it is, more damage at the centre than at the outside. And we can clearly see that when we start putting these two things together. Look, high intensity, then we get this zone here where it's mm, doing a lot of damage and then we get this little tail at the end where we're doing virtually no damage and my suspicion is that tail is actually out here somewhere because it, there's so little there's so little intensity just here at the tail that it's not having the ability to even burn this paper now this picture that I've got here can be read two ways here's my basic intensity of light and if I leave the light on for one second it will do this amount of damage in the material. If I leave it on for two seconds it'll do that amount of material three four five six seven eight nine ten and after ten seconds look I've burnt a hole which is this shape which you've seen me do many times before. But equally well we could look at this and say well here's what my beam looks like when I'm using 20% power. It's fairly flat because there's not a, a big difference between the intensity at the centre 
and the intensity towards the edge. As I wind the power onto the tube to maybe 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, etc., up to 100%, Here's what my shape of my beam would look like proportionately at 100%. Here. So I've got a very, very high proportion of intensity at the centre of the beam in relation to what's happening at the edge of the beam. Okay, so I get a much more spiky beam when I turn the power up. So what we've got here, we've got a piece of constant material. So I'm going to basically be changing the shape of the beam like this and I'm also going to be changing the duration or the exposure time of the beam to this piece of constant material. I've already set this machine up in a mode that I've shown you before. It's very convenient for me when I'm using this in manual mode to go to this thing here called manual set. So if I drop down to manual set, press enter, what you'll find is I've set the manual mode, which is basically these arrow controls, to step manually one millimeter every time I press the button. Okay? Now at the same time, what I've also done, just press escape, I've now gone to laser set as well. And I've got something similar on there. I've turned that to manual mode and I'll set the time to 50 milliseconds. Mm, maybe we ought to try that to start with at maybe 20 milliseconds. So let's, let's change that to 20 milliseconds. We'll go 20, 50, 100, maybe 200 milliseconds. We'll do some various tests because this basically is the, uh, the duration time, the exposure time that I'm going to allow the beam to hit my paper. 20 milliseconds of burn. Enter. Escape. I've got a piece of material here which I was going to use as a focus gauge, 63.5, which is exactly what this focus is. And I was going to set it there. But I've decided what I'm going to do, I'm going to set the focus low. So what I'm going to do is change this from 63.5 down to 58.5. Okay, so we've now modified that little gauge to 58.5. So it's five millimeters short. And I've got my table set to zero. So what I'm now going to do is start dropping the table by one millimeter at a time. But of course we're starting off at supposedly five millimeters less than the manufacturer's focal point. So there we go. So that's the focal point minus five millimeters. We're going to do a pulse. I'm going to drop the table by one millimeter. And I'm going to move the head forward one millimeter. And now I'm going to do another pulse. and look at these under the microscope. I'm going to change that pulse from 20 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds. If the focal point is that point where all the rays pass through, you immediately have to ask the question, why is it that the focal point dot is bigger now than it was previously. If I now double it and go up to a hundred milliseconds, I think we can fairly comfortably guess what's going to happen. I didn't mention it, but I started the power off at 19%. So there's not a huge amount of power here. We're using this beam in its flattish form. So we can clearly see that duration or exposure time is having a significant effect. Okay, so now I'm going to go somewhere completely the opposite extreme. I'm going to put the power up to 
99% full power. I know, you think I'm going to blow the paper up. Well, I'm also going to change the exposure time as well. So this is basically full 70 watts at 5 milliseconds. And for those that are interested, here's the choreography of the keyboard. a different and interesting set of results when I change the power to 100% and limit the exposure time. Let's go and have a look at those under the microscope and we'll maybe plot some data. Okay so let's take a quick look at these results um, because there's some quite interesting stuff here. Now here we've got the distance to the material. The focal length on this lens is claimed to be 63.5 62.5, 64.5, so we're going up in two millimetre steps. So just here, where these dots are, is supposed to be the focal length of this lens. Hmm. Certainly doesn't look like it, does it? Okay, so what we've got on the screen here is the first dot in this pattern. And you'll see that it says that it is 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.8 diameter. Now I've got a scale on here which I've created and this scale is allows me to very quickly measure and so here we go look I can see that this is 0.4 below and 0.4 above zero so that's my 0.8 dimension that I've got on there. Now within that picture what I've also estimated is first of all is there a hole in the middle? No. Is this area carbony black or is it scorchy brown? A hole? No. So we've got zero. And then we've got this orange section here, which is effectively the extent of the black. And I've assumed that there's a little teeny weeny bit of brownish around the outside. This is very, very subjective, as you can see. So you know, that probably accounts for some of this odd variations in the pattern. Now, this second image shows something a bit different. We've got a piece of green paper in the background and the light intensity now has been sufficient at the centre of the beam to exceed the damage threshold for the paper, for the card, and it's burnt its way through the card. Okay, so here we've got a small hole, a burn and a scorch, which are exactly the same. So there we go, I've got a scorch mark in red around the outside of a black ring in orange. And so that's the way that this diagram has con been constructed. Now we'll just quickly run through and you'll see how things change. And you think, ah, the hole is getting, oh, oh, oh what's going on there? So all of a sudden we've got a hole We've got a very high intensity burn and then we've got a lightweight scorch around the outside which is what we're seeing here. The hole is what we want for cutting, that tells us what power we've got, but the mark around the outside of the hole is what we want for engraving because we don't want to cut holes when we engrave, we want to mark the surface of the product. Now all of a sudden you'll notice that the outer diameter has decreased to about a minimum somewhere about there okay and so that's these two points here okay and now we're going to start to get bigger and we're going to start to get bigger quite quickly but you'll notice the hole in the middle is staying pretty much the same diameter although we've reached a let's call it a focus. We haven't really reached a focus at all. So this focal point here is somewhere around about 66 or 67.5. Yeah, we, we can see that this is the smallest part of the graph, but is that a focal point? Does that mean that all the rays are passing through at that point? Well, obviously the answer is no, because look, <laughs> we've still got rays out here, which are burning. Let's just compare. So we're about the same at the end here, 
at 50 milliseconds, our spot has gone from 0.4 to about 0.5. You'll notice we've still got our lovely spike of power right through the middle that's making these holes, our cutting power. So even though we've pushed the exposure time up, we haven't changed the focus. Well, the focus, it's a very, very weird word there. I, I think the focus that they normally generate is created by putting parallel rays of uniform light through the lens to achieve a nominal focal point. That's how the probably the lens calculation software works. We don't have a uniform beam of light passing through. We've got a non-uniform beam of light. So the most powerful beam is passing somewhere through the center and the least powerful beams are coming in from the outside. Now we'll talk about that again in a minute. So by increasing the duration, the exposure time, we've allowed the beam to burn more. Well, we've got a black ring and a scorch around the outside, as you can see, a black ring with a scorch around the outside. So this is how I'm able to graduate these into sections, three, three separate graduations. But the smallest hole does not coincide with the focal point, which is 63.5. And that smallest hole does not coincide with the smallest external damage. 0.5 is what we've got here for 50 milliseconds. We've got about 0.5 or maybe 0.55. And again, look, 67.5 is our nominal power focus. Not necessarily the light focus, but this is the aggregation at which we get a burn. There's enough power on this material to create a burn of that size. Okay, so that's what our nominal 20, 50 and 100 millisecond burns look like. The one thing I want to just point out to you is I'm going to focus this up and you'll see me focusing it up onto the surface of the material. There we go. So there's the surface of the paper and you can see the, you can see the, you can see the strands, the fibers in the, in the paper. Okay. And you can see that this is really nicely in focus, but look at this here. Can you see that? That's, although there's a hole in that paper, there's also like a little crater that drops away. And as I lift the paper up towards and bring it into focus, you'll see that coming into focus and then the bottom of the hole coming into focus. But the top of the paper is now out of focus. So we've got like a little crater in the top of that paper now. It's not just a hole. You can see exactly the same thing there, crater with a hole in the bottom. If you look at my diagram here, you'll see that I've only got two lines. I've got a hole and I've got a profile around the outside here. There is no black. There is only low energy and high energy. So let's just carry on and you'll see that same pattern happening throughout. If I again go in and focus, the bottom of the hole is smaller than the top and I've got a sort of a little pit there. So it's a, it's a tapered hole that I've created in that paper, even though the paper is only 0.3 millimeters thick. So here we are coming up to the focus and I think we've gone past the focus now. But you'll notice how relatively clean and undamaged the outside of those holes are. Now I wonder why that would be. Before we move off, we've got a 0.4 spot size again. Now this is, we've not been able to find any way that we can get smaller than a 0.4 I keep using this word spot size, but this is a point where we get an aggregate burn. This isn't the point through which all the rays are passing. Now, a two inch lens has got a nominal spot size of about 0.1. They don't actually show you on here what a 
spot size should be for a two and a half inch lens. We've got a 76 which is a three inch lens so we'll interpolate between those and say it's roughly 120 microns, 0.12 of a millimetre. As I said, I've never been able to get closer than about four times the theoretical spot size that is claimed in books. Here's one of the 100 millisecond burns where we've got this very nice separation between the central power, the central intensity, which has destroyed the paper. Then we've got some fairly high power round here, which has burnt the paper. And then we've got a much lower area around the outside where the paper has been scorched. This was done with very low power, 19%. As I described to you before we started these tests, what we've effectively done, we've got a fairly low power beam being sent into the lens. Now when I say low power, it's got low intensity at the centre, relatively speaking, because we've turned the power right down. But what we have got is a very small difference between the maximum intensity and the minimum intensity. Although we've got power at the centre here to destroy this area, we've still got a lot of power down here. Look at that slope angle which is causing this to happen. We've allowed enough time for this section here to burn and do damage, but it's not powerful enough to actually exceed the damage threshold of the material. And then we've got this section down here, right at the bottom, where it's able to scorch because we've given it enough time. This is so close to zero power down here that normally you wouldn't see it. So what's the difference between this image and the one that we saw previously? Well, in this instance, what we've done, we've changed the shape of our beam before it goes into the lens. We've wound up the power and in winding up the power, what we've done, we've forced the intensity of the center of the beam to this sort of shape. We've got a nearly parallel spike of power doing this damage. And we've only got a little teeny weeny bit of low power right at the bottom of here, which has got enough time to do any damage. So we've actually filtered out the low power down here with making the beam tall and thin and only using a small amount of time. So this is a very complex interplay between the lens and the beam. Now the good thing is we didn't change the focal point or the power focal point when we messed around with these characteristics. So we've got a good stable starting point for the next part of my experiment. Well this testing was basically static testing. So you know we were burning a hole in one spot there was no movement on the head so we had total control of the exposure time. If we start moving the head things are probably going to change. What I've done is my very simple crude analogy. Now here we've got a diameter an outside diameter of our burn at about 0.4 millimeters. So if this here is 0.4 I'm going to have one two and a half of those pushed side by side which will make up one millimetre. So one millimetre will actually then take five milliseconds, five milliseconds and two and a half milliseconds which is a total of twelve and a half milliseconds per millimetre. And twelve and a half milliseconds divided into a second gives me a speed of eighty millimetres a second. Uh, a focus test with lines running at eighty millimetres a second with ninety nine percent power very crude focus gauges there. One is 58.5 and the other 63.5. So I think to get somewhere in the middle of my 8mm scale what I'm going to have to do is to put the 58.5 on top of that 3mm there so that it sets me 61.5 as my starting gap. 61.5 starting position and this is going to be 99% at 80 per second, 80 millimetres a second.
61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 66 or 67.5. A second. I wonder what happens if I push that up to 400 millimeters a second. You can hardly see any difference between the thickness of those lines now, but the interesting question is why? When we look at it very carefully under the uh, under an eyeglass, I can clearly see that number four is the thinnest one of those. And number four is actually 65.5. So the focus has dropped by a millimeter as I increase the speed from 80 to 400. In fact, I will just go and measure that under the microscope. We, we can clearly see here, we've got a nice groove, which is only 0.15 of a millimeter wide. You can clearly see here the shadow of the original 0.4 beam. But because we've basically used speed as a power filter, basically what we've done, we've reduced the exposure time of the power out at this part of the beam so that it is not going to exceed the damage threshold of the material. The central part of the beam has got sufficient power or intensity to still exceed the damage threshold of the material and consequently that's why we've got this deep burn. These two completely different results come from the same lens, set the same distance away from the work, using the same material, the same power, 99%. The only difference between these two is the speed. What we're seeing here is a difference of exposure time. So when you get a mess of focus like that and add to it intensity which is completely variable like that, it's little wonder that you can't really predict what the lens is going to do. I would have said that as we increase the power we would actually make the focal length increase because we'll be filtering out some of this stuff here and leaving this more powerful part but my assumption is wrong because the net result of all these interfering powers from different parts of the lens are actually shortening the focal length. So before we finish this session I'm going to turn that lens over and put it flat side down. Now I know these are exaggerated pictures but when we turn the lens over we have a double refraction once inside the lens and one, out, and one outside the lens and the net result is we get a much more compact focal point. So we're going to go out of focus, into focus and out of focus pretty quickly. So turning the lens over has created a millimetre difference in the power focus and when we run at 400 millimetres a second it's also created about a millimetre difference in the power focus. The other thing that's obvious is that when we run slowly we see all sorts of variations in power but because we've got a much more tighter and compact convergence of rays of different powers things are going to happen quicker. And we can see this here look we've got a huge change very very quickly but here we haven't got the same huge variation because we've got the power focus stretched out over a much longer distance. When we run fast, we're filtering out all the outside crud, and we're doing the same here. We're filtering out all the outside crud, and all we're left with is the power that's passing right through the center. And if you look, that doesn't look very much different at all. There is no such thing on our machine as light focus. There is no single focal point what we see is not the light focus as you would with a magnifying glass. We're seeing a power focus, not a light focus. So as I've mentioned to you on many occasions, I've got no idea where these sessions are going to finish up or what my next session is going to be, other than generally, I think it's still involving lenses because I've still got a lot to learn. This points me 
in the direction of what we're going to carry out next time. I can clearly see here that we've got power filtering by virtue of exposure time. In other words, the faster I run, the more I'm filtering out this low power that's here, but not having a chance to have any effect. So what that tells me is that I need to modify this lens that's in here, removing the outside until all I leave is this high central power. I'm going to try and filter out this low stuff by not letting it come through the lens. In other words, I'm hopeful I'm going to be able to make just a, a powerful cutting lens. Thanks very much for your patience and your time, and I'll catch up with you in the next session.